We're going to go ahead and get started. This is the second scientific session on GI malignancies. And the first presentation was going to be given by Dr. Benjamin Oren Spieler, who was the recipient of a travel grant award. He unfortunately cannot be here today because his wife just delivered a baby. So um, we would like to congratulate him on both accomplishments. All right, good morning. It's my pleasure to give this presentation for Dr. Spieler, who couldn't be here today. Um, and this is his work that he did about the impact of change in the stomach volume on the dose delivered to the stomach and the duodenum during pancreas SBRT. So as mentioned, Ben's wife gave birth to a beautiful young boy two days ago, so he's busy taking care of more important business, but he wants to thank the organization committee for the award. So the hypothesis of his work was that when compared to non-adaptive approach, MRI-guided adaptive radiation therapy could reduce the dose delivered to the duodenum and stomach during SBRT for locally advanced pancreatic cancer. He used the CT scan, the MRI, sorry, of 10 patients who were treated for locally advanced pancreas cancer in our department. All patients were treated with five fraction SBRT to a dose between 30 and 40 gray on the Vury Meridian system. Patients were all instructed to be fasting for three hours before the simulation studies, as well as for each treatment day. The original plan was to cover the PTV with 90% of the prescribed dose, and all the organs at risk constraints were met on the original plan. Non-adaptive and adaptive plans for each fraction were compared. Here are the dose to the organs at risk, which were used as dose constraint for each initial plan. The results. Despite clear fasting instructions that were provided to every patient treated, you could notice here that the volume of the stomach was highly variable from day to day. We have here plotted on a graph from day zero, which is the planning CT and MRI day, to the fifth fraction of radiation, the variation in the stomach volume. The variation was in a median of 150, and a mean of 150 cc, or 50% of the initial volume. What was the impact of this variation observed in the stomach volume? If we look, for example, on this first graph, on the dose delivered to the duodenum, V30 was significantly modified. One of the line, the bottom line shows what adaptive plan could uh, lead to. So on the bottom line, you see that with adaptive plan, despite the fact that the stomach volume change was significant between each day, by doing an adaptive treatment, the dose to V30 was the same. However, in non-adaptive plan, the volume of duodenum receiving third degree was increased. This is a satin graph showing the duodenum D max depending on the stomach volume. Although that for this parameter it didn't reach significant difference, we could see that there is a trend and that D max was higher in non-adaptive plan. What about the dose on the stomach itself? Again, V30 was higher with changes in stomach volume and it did reach a significant difference between non-adaptive and an adaptive approach. Same thing goes for the Dmax to the stomach. So all this put together we have here a table which is summarizing what was the dose to all visceral organs in non-adaptive versus adaptive plan, and then the dose to the 90% coverage of the volume. Sorry, I want to go back. All right. So on the top line, we could see that there is only 16% of the plan where for both non-adaptive and adaptive, the PTV coverage was met. 
In the adaptive plan, we were able to meet the PTV coverage across the five days by adapting for the change in stomach volume, and there was no plan where non-adaptive would have been superior to an adaptive approach. All visceral organs objectives were met in both plans for 28% of the cases only, and 38% additional plans met the objective for the dose to the organ at risk. For a total of 64% of the plans where we met the dose constraints by using an adaptive approach. Where did we meet both the tumor coverage and the organs at risk coverage? In 60% of the adaptive approach, but only in 6% of the non-adaptive plan. So in conclusion, for SBRT of locally advanced pancreatic cancer, interfraction variations in stomach volume lead to increased dose to the organs at risk in non-adaptive approach. Using MRI-guarded ART mitigates for the impact of variation in stomach volume on the dose for the duodenum in stomach while maintaining PTV coverage. Therefore, we think that the dose escalation trials for LAPC using SBRT with MRI-guided ART are warranted. Thank you. Our next presentation will be by Hisham El Helawani, and the title of the talk is Outcomes of Patients in the National Cancer Database Treated Non-Surgically for Localized Rectal Cancer. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be among you today and to have my name called correctly for the very first time. Thanks, Dr. Lloyd. Uh, and I'm here to share with you our group's work on the study of outcomes of patients in the National Cancer Database treated non-surgically for localized rectal cancer. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So the standard of care for stages two and three rectal cancer has evolved significantly over the past 30 years, starting in 1990 when surgery followed by combination chemoradiotherapy has been announced as has been recommended by the NCI consensus statement, moving forward to 2004 where neoadjuvant CRT followed by surgery has become the SOS. And now in 2018, the question would be, would non-operative management NOM or watch and wait for neo ad after neoadjuvant chemotherapy would become the new SOS? So evidence for NOM has been growing for the past years, starting with retrospective analysis, and of course I'm referring to the seminal work by uh, Habert Gamma Group in Brazil, moving to prospective single arm observational studies, as well as large scale population based registry studies. Thus, the premise is to accumulate enough evidence for randomized controlled trials. So along the same lines, our group conducted this study. We aim to analyze the survival outcomes and prognostic factors for patients with localized rectal adenocarcinoma in the National Cancer Database, NCDB, undergoing chemoradiation without surgical intervention. We queried the NCDB for patients with non-metastatic rectal adenocarcinoma diagnosed from 2004 through 2014 and treated with external beam radiotherapy to the pelvis for a total dose of minimum 45 grays or higher, who did not undergo a surgical resection. Following the inclusion and exclusion criteria, we managed to cone down the initial database of around 244K to just 8,400 patients. The cohort was further subdivided into three subsets based on the prescribed RT dose to less than 50.4 grays, 50.4 50, uh, 50 to 54 grays and higher than 54 grays or the escalated, fraction, uh, fr escalated dose. Furthermore, univariate and multivariate analysis followed with overall survival compared using the log rank test. So starting with the baseline characteristics, interestingly, we find more females in this cohort more than the males, and we further subdivided the cohort in, uh, in, based on the diagnosis year in order to take into consideration the changes in the edition of the AGCC from the sixth to the seventh edition before and after 2009. The median age and diagnosis for this cohort was slightly higher than the general populations, 66 versus 63. And as expected, because they are all stage two and three, most of the patients were two, either uh, T3 or T4 or N positive. For the facility, the NOM approach was reported both for the community centers as well as the academic centers. And for the radiotherapy modality, it was just 16% uh, of the patients who received IMRT, 
But as the, this was uh, observed by a previous NCDB analysis by Kaufman et al., that the rate of IMRT has been growing uh, in the past few years, although it's more observed in the adjuvant rather than the neoadjuvant setting. Back to our NCDB analysis, the median RT dose prescribed was 50.4 grays, and the majority of the patients, more than 75%, received chemotherapy concurrently, plus or minus sequentially, either as a single agent or a combination. And for 78% of the patients, the, the, the no surgery uh, the, or the NOM was not otherwise planned. For the subgroup analysis based on the prescribed RT dose, the three subcohorts, uh, we noticed that, uh, the, uh, that most of the radiation oncologists apparently were more cautious when doing the dose escalation with, for the females. But when, when it comes to age, apparently the median age for the patient cohort, subcohort who received higher than 54 grays was higher than the other two subcohorts, 72. And you, doing a, a univariate and multivariate analysis, we found that being a male or older than 67 with a co uh, comorbidity index, Charleston comorbidity index higher than zero, having a node positive disease, or being treated in a non-private medical insurance, or receiving no chemotherapy, all were uh, associated with worse overall survival. Uh, for the survival analysis stratified by the RT dose, we found that, interestingly, we found that the patients who received moderate dose escalation, which is from 50.4 to 54 grays, had significantly higher overall survival on multivariate analysis than the patients who received lower doses. And interestingly also, we found that the patients with dose escalation, had the dose escalation higher than 54 grays had detrimental effect on overall survival. So I won't say limitations because actually the NCDB database provides like a unique opportunity for large scale studies, but areas for improvement that would allow to like optimize the results uh, that can be obtained from such an analysis would be uh, having the following available. Clinical evidence of response, the interval between the termination of CRT and response evaluation, having oncologic endpoints other than overall survival, and of course, patient reported outcomes or quality of life metrics, specifically the anorectal function, other RT modalities or fractionation schemes or other systemic therapy agents or schedules. So to conclude, this study may help counseling patients who either decline surgery or who are not medically candidates for surgery about their expected outcomes with a completely non-surgical approach. Given the inherent uncertainty of the registry-based retrospective analyses, these results need to be confirmed prospectively. And in the end, I would like to acknowledge the guidance and support of my co-authors, Drs. Emma Holliday, Pamela Allen, Omar Abdurrahman, and my mentor, Dr. Clifton Fuller. And also, I would like to applaud the American College of Surgeons and the American Cancer Society for the great work curating and disseminating this data set and allowing, to be me, allowing me to be among you today. Thank you for your attention. So our next presentation is also a travel award recipient. It is uh, June K. Lee, and he will be presenting on pathologic response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and chemoradiation in borderline resectable adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for this opportunity to give this talk. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So pancreatic cancer is a leading cause of cancer death in the United States. Last year, it afflicted over 53,000 people, resulting in about 34,000 deaths. It is a disease of the elderly population, which most commonly presents with obstructive jaundice. So here we see a representative CT of the abdomen, which demonstrates a hypodense, hypoenhancing mass abutting the duodenum in close, uh, approximate, close to the vasculature in that region, biopsy proven to be adenocarcinoma. Um, so the completeness of resection is truly the driver of survival outcomes in this particular diagnosis. Unfortunately, only the minority of patients will be resectable at presentation. Furthermore, the five-year overall survival for even those patients who are able to undergo a complete R0 resection is only about 20%. Tumor resectability is based on the degree of vascular involvement. Listed are some common vessels that may be involved. In the image to the left there, we see a, uh, the best case scenario in which there is no contact between the tumor and the vasculature. 
on the right, we see complete encasement of the regional vasculature by the tumor, in which case surgical resection would not be appropriate. Borderline resectable pancreatic, pancreatic cancer is an intermediate entity in between either end of the spectrum. Now, different institutions, societies, and guidelines define borderline resectability differently, but many surgeons would agree that it represents a situation in which there's less than 180 degree involvement of the vasculature by tumor. There are many different approaches to treating borderline resectable cancer. The rationale that I want to focus on is aggressive neoadjuvant tr treatments. Now, there are many reasons why we would want to do this. I would argue that most importantly, it may improve the chances of an R0 resection. So in the schematic to the right, this principle is illustrated. On the top, we see a tumor that appears to directly abut the superior mesenteric artery. If a surgeon were to take this patient directly to surgery, there may be a high chance of a positive margin. Whereas, if that same patient were to achieve a favorable response to new adjuvant treatment, that tumor may potentially shrink away from the vasculature, improving the chances of an R0 resection. So with that background in mind, we sought to investigate the safety and efficacy of new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation prior to surgery and to identify factors which may contribute to pathologic response as well as predictors of survival. So in this exploratory analysis, we looked at 15 patients with biopsy-proven pancreatic cancer. All patients underwent a complete surgical workup or staging workup. All patients were determined by a multidisciplinary tumor board to have borderline resectable disease, which was defined both radiographically as well as biochemically based on literature, mostly in the post-operative setting, which demonstrates inferior survival outcomes in patients with elevated CA-199 levels and patients had to otherwise be good candidates for surgery. There were several different neoadjuvant chemotherapy regimens that were offered at the discretion of the medical oncologist, whereas the radiation portion was more or less standardized. Everyone received 50.4 gray in 28 fractions. An initial 45 gray was delivered to the gross tumor and regional lymph nodes, followed by a 4.5 gray boost, sorry, 5.4 gray boost to the, to the gross disease. Highly conformal techniques with daily image guidance was given, and radiosensitizing capecitabine or gemcitabine was given concurrent with the radiation. All patients underwent a laparoscopic restaging prior to surgical resection, which took place within six weeks of the neoadjuvant treatment by a surgeon specializing in GI malignancies. And uh, two independent pathologists assisted in the scoring of the pathologic response according to the modified Ryan scheme. And finally, uh, statistical analyses were performed to identify predictors of survival. So here are our results. The median age was 60 years. The median CA-199 at the time of diagnosis was 469. All patients successfully completed the radiation treatment with only one patient experiencing a grade 2 GI toxicity. Following new adjuvant treatment, the median CA-199 level was 52, all below baseline levels. No patient was found to progress prior to surgery, and all but one patient was able to undergo an R0 resection. In the table to the right, we see the clinical and pathologic stages of all 15 patients. The majority of the patients were found to have a downstaging of their, of their disease at the time of surgery, whereas about a third of patients, which are highlighted in bold, these patients were found to have um, uh, upstaging. With respect to the tumor regression scores, we found that less than half the patients, um, sorry, less than half the patients was their agreement between the pathologists, whereas at least 70% of patients were found to have a partial uh, pathological response or greater by the two pathologists. Furthermore, only the pre-RTCA199 was found to be associated with pathologic tumor response. Um, following surgery, we had about three quarters of patients who went on to receive adjuvant chemotherapy. The median progression free and overall survival were 35 months and 36 months, respectively. And finally, five patients were found to have disease recurrence, all of whom failed distantly. So here are our conclusions new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation facilitated an R0 resection in the majority of patients. Radiation therapy was very well tolerated with only one patient experiencing grade two GI toxicity. 
at least a partial pathologic response was achieved in the majority of patients. Only pre-RT CA99 was associated with pathologic response. The median overall survival of our cohort was 36 months, and all treatment failures occurred distantly. So we feel that these results warrant further investigation of neoadjuvant therapy in a larger cohort of patients. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors and especially my mentor, Dr. Farzan Siddiq, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Soong Jun Ma, and the title of the talk is Neoadjuvant versus Adjuvant Radiation Therapy for Resectable Pancreatic Cancer, a Propensity Score Matched Analysis. Good morning. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to thank the uh, committee for the uh, inv invitation to give this talk. Um, I'm Sung Ma, a medical student from Oswald Park, and I'm here to, to uh, present the uh, new adjuvant versus adjuvant radiation therapy for resectable pancreas. No disclosure. So for resectable pancreatic cancer, uh, surgery followed by adjuvant therapies are widely used. Um, but the, uh, in the, within the past decade, uh, like the, for example, the phase two studies from MD Anderson showing that new adjuvant therapies, um, you know, have some promising outcomes. Um, but there's no prospective trial with the mature data uh, comparing these two approaches. So for our study, uh, we used the uh, CR database, uh, population database capturing uh, about 28% of the uh, U.S. population, identifying the uh, pathology stage one, two, three, pancreatic adenocarcinoma uh, treated with the uh, tri trimodality surgery, chemo, external beam. Our endpoints were overall survival and the cancer-specific survival, and uh, um, we also used a Kaplan-Meier Cox regression and propensity score matching one-to-one -one ratio. So here are the results. Uh, there were a total 1,081 um, patients with a stage one, two, three pancreatic cancer um, treated with the trimodality. And out of those, there were about 160 patients uh, underwent the uh, new adjuvant radiation. After matching, there were uh, 292 patients, um, the total, uh, with 146 patients in each arm, new adjuvant versus adjuvant. All the variables are well balanced. Uh, the majority of patients had the uh, stage two diseases, uh, moderately or poorly differentiated um, adenocarcinoma located at the uh, pancreatic head. When you compare these two different sequencing of the uh, uh, radiation therapy, uh, there was no difference in overall survival and cancer-specific survival. The median survival for um, the new adjuvant was 16 months uh, and 18 months for the adjuvant setting. When you stratify these patients uh, based on the nodal status, uh, the patients with the positive nodes um, had the worst overall survival as well as a cancer-specific survival. And these graphs uh, look um, almost identical. After you stratify these patients uh, based on the tumor grade, um, the, the, top, the, uh, the solid line at the, at the most um, top, at the top was the um, well-differentiated tumors. The line at the middle is a moderately uh, differentiated tumors, and then the dashed line at the, uh, the bottom is uh, poorly differentiated um, tumors. And you can see that the poorly differentiated tumors had worse overall survival and cancer-specific survival uh, when compared with uh, well or moderate um, the differentiated uh, tumors. So in summary, uh, this retrospective study uh, based on the, uh, using the CR database um, is showing the uh, new adjuvant and adjuvant radiation therapies um, have a comparable survival outcomes. And, um, and as, you can, as you can see, the positive nodal status and the poorly differentiated tumors were independent uh, prognostic factors for worse mortality. Um, I'd like to thank the co-authors for their contribution um, and thank you for your attention. Our last presentation is by Dr. Stacy Scheich, uh, Patterns of Care and Factors Predictive of Overall Survival in Metastatic Rectal Cancer. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have, uh, I have no disclosures. Um, <clears throat> so 20% of patients will present with metastatic rectal cancer at initial diagnosis, and treatment often entails chemotherapy, radiation, or a combination of the two. 
We aim to utilize the National Cancer Database to evaluate patterns of care and to determine overall survival of patients with metastatic rectal cancer who received these treatments. We uh, analyzed 2,385 patients um, with metastatic rectal cancer who did not undergo surgery, who were treated between 2004 and 2014. They were excluded if they had surgery at all, um, radiation anywhere other than to the pelvis, or if they died within one month of treatment. The endpoint was overall survival. Logistics and Cox regression were used to determine predictors of treatment and overall survival. And survival analysis was performed with Kaplan-Meier and log rank analysis. This graph shows treatment trends over time. The use of chemotherapy alone significantly increased over the period, and the use of chemotherapy and radiation significantly decreased over the treatment period. Um, in terms of treatment modality, 12% received no treatment, 10% received radiation alone, 43% received chemotherapy alone, and 36% received chemotherapy and radiation. In terms of radiation fractionation, 13% received less than or equal to 25 gray, 13% between 26 and 30 gray, and 43% between 31 uh, gray and 50.39, and 32% received greater than or equal to 50.4 gray. Can we go back? Uh, factors predictive of receiving radiation on univariate analysis included age greater than 65, Medicare insurance, uh, clinical stage T2, T3, or T4 disease, but the only factor predictive of receiving radiation on a multivariate analysis was clinical stage T3 disease. Factors that were predictive of improved overall survival on univariate analysis were receipt of chemotherapy, Hispanic race, and presence of lung metastasis only. Factors that were predictive of decreased overall survival on univariate analysis were receipt of radiation, age greater than 65, female gender, Medicare insurance, uh, increasing burden of comorbidities, and treatment at a non-academic center. Factors predictive of improved overall survival on multivariate analysis were receipt of chemotherapy, Hispanic race, presence of lung metastasis, and income of greater than 46,000. Factors predictive of decreased overall survival on multivariate analysis were increasing comorbidities and presence of bone metastases only. This graph shows our Kaplan-Meier survival estimates. Um, you can see that chemotherapy alone and chemoradiation have improved survival compared to no treatment and radiation alone, and there is no significant difference between the addition of radiation um, as compared to chemotherapy alone. Five-year overall survival with no treatment, radiation alone, chemotherapy alone, or the combination were 46%, 56%, 84%, and 79%. In conclusion, metastatic rectal cancer patients with T3 tumors were more likely to receive radiation. The use of radiation alone and chemoradiation declined over the study period. The use of chemotherapy alone is increasing, and chemotherapy is associated with a higher overall survival compared to no treatment and radiation alone. Radiation alone may be a proxy for more symptomatic local disease, which may be associated with worse survival. Thank you.